we're going to make a start, everyone. First of all, um, I'd like to say a, a massive welcome and thank you for everyone who's signed up to the webinar and who's joined us live right now. Uh, my name's Paul Bright. I'm the technical director for the coaching manual. And today we have a fantastic webinar lined up for everybody. Um, the, the session that we're going to actually look at and cover and break down is available on, available on thecoachingmanual.com. Um, and any comments on the session, on the live feed, um, you can also put on social media, on Twitter, at Coaching Manual. So just to, before I introduce today's guest, I'm going to introduce today's structure of the webinar so everybody's clear on what the outcomes are and what we're looking to achieve today. So uh, we had the pleasure to film um, with the League Managers Association with our special guest today, uh, a full session um, late last year at St. George's Park in the UK. So we are going to introduce the session. We're going to break down each practice within the session. So look at the real detail, the coaching delivery, the methodology and the underpinning knowledge behind it. Um, and throughout the webinar, um, we will be moderating and taking live questions. And also, if we do not get a chance to answer your question in today's webinar, we will also provide um, a review and a follow-up piece on thecoachingmanual.com to obviously answer your questions and, and, and get you to be able to tap into to the knowledge of our special guests. So on to our guest today. Um, one of the most experienced and, and respected coaches globally. Um, our guest today has worked at every level of the game, from um, youth players within the grassroots game all the way through to, to Ballon d'Or winners who, who are applying the trade at the very, very highest levels of, of football. Um, previous um, experiences and roles um, include skills development coach at Manchester United, so really um, creating the underpinning coaching philosophy and methodology at the club, which have gone on to produce a number of high quality professional players. Um, our guest has been a first team coach um, and Premier League manager um, with, with Fulham Football Club and also with Bromby. Um, our guest has been a consultant for MLS um, club, uh, including Philadelphia Union and is the current assistant manager of the Australian national team. And many people within the US may also know Rennie um, through his work with the Mullenstein Method and GIS um, and his work across the US in, in working with youth players. So on that note, Rennie, um, a long introduction there, but absolutely fantastic to have you on and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And um, um, Thank you for having me uh, for this webinar. Um, I thought it was uh, it was a great session that we uh, we did. I think the webinars, especially in this difficult time with the with the coronavirus, it, it affects everybody. It affects everybody that is involved in football as well. Uh, so, what better way to use those webinars to uh, to again to get an opportunity to learn, you know, for the people, and that's that's what I'm here for. I'm here to share my experience and my expertise that I've gained over almost 40 years of coaching. Um, as you said, at, at any level of work, at any junior level, uh, senior level, uh, right, right all the way to the top. Um, so, so that's good. So I really hope that uh, the people that are, you know, joined into this webinar uh, after this hour will, uh, will benefit from it from an educational point of view, from an informative point of view. Uh, and I, uh, we, we're looking forward to do uh, many more uh, in the not too distant future. Back to you, Paul. Fantastic, Rennie. Thanks. Thanks for that and thanks for the introduction. So I'm just going to start the webinar off with one of a quick overview clip, really, of, of the session that, that we um, captured with you down, down at St. George's. And from there, um, we will get into, obviously, your, your underpinning coaching methodology before we set the scene. So if you, if you don't mind bearing with me one minute. Very simple, we start with two balls straight away. You guys use this channel to go to that side. You guys use that channel to go to that side. Sorry, what's your name again? Will and Dan. Very simple, you're sort of in front of the mannequins. Can we take your place, Dan? Just come and stand on this side. It's very simple, he decides on this side. 
You know, he just comes off a little bit. You play me the ball. That's it. I set you back in there. Boom. You play to this person here. You set it on the inside. That's it. Wait, 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 wait. I'll be going. You take that place. And I'll play you there. Yeah? And I take that place. The same thing is happening on that side. Yeah? So you just keep going sort of in a circle. Very simple. And then obviously we get game realistic movements. Yeah, nice so and sharp. That's Pat. really setting the scene, Renny, for for um, your content and, and and what we're about to discuss today. So fantastic playing through the thirds um, session. So obviously I'll hand it back to you just to really kick us off with your underpinning, you know, guiding principles and methodology around how you deliver everything, really. <laughs> My parameter that I do uh, in past and present is what are the sort of things that I keep in the back of my head, um, you know, to um, you know to make sure that I can deliver it in the best possible way. So I would like to kick the webinar off with uh, with this little uh, slide, which I like to share with with everybody. Yeah. Um, that's it. Yeah. So if, if you look at guidelines for practice then the first thing you need to keep in the back of your head is what is the purpose of the practice and as we know we all work at different levels different age groups some work with boys some work with girls some work with very young players some work with older players or even senior players the key is to be very clear about the purpose regarding this session the purpose was all about you know breaking lines forward passes forward runs that is what i wanted to achieve with this group of players, which I've never worked with, the group of players was uh, a selection of university players. So I had to uh, try to gauge their level as well. And that is what I was doing with that passing drill, where basically I wanted them to introduce to the principles of the session and already get them to think about, you know, what this session is all about. It's about thinking forward, looking forward, play forward and forward run. So that was the purpose. Now, if you know the purpose, the next thing then you need to start thinking about what is the organization going to look like in the different parts of the training. So you have a warm up, you have a middle bit, and you have a sort of an end to the practice, which is normally most of the time a game situation. So you need to think about the organization. What are the key things you need to think about? Again, you need to think about the level of the players that you're working with. Regarding the level, you need to then start to think about the distances that you use. Yeah, because when you work with very small players, don't make the distances too big because it will not work. Same vice versa, if you work with all the players and the distances are too small, it won't work either. It's, it's part of a little bit of the experience that you need to have in this organization. I think I worked sort of in between, you know, sort of between 10, 15 and 20 meters all the way through. Yeah. And then throughout the session, you go into a different setup from box to box. Later on, it became more a game situation. But it's important that the organization links with the purpose what you want to achieve. The organization needs to work for you. Yeah, that's important. If you do different things in training, like we all do, it's important that you prepare yourself well, that you don't lose a lot of time when you move from one section to the next. Try to set up your organization that you go from you know, part A to part B to part C, with maybe just taking a few cones away or adding a few things or a few goals, whatever it is, but minimize the time for the players that they are not really active because of you organizing <clears throat> the organization. If the organization is set, the first thing then what I do is I give instruction. You put the players in the right position, whatever you want to do, and then you tell them, this is what we're going to do. It's important. To understand that players, they all learn in different ways. Yeah, some you can tell them and they understand. Some players you have to show them. Some players actually only get it when they do it. So every player has got different buttons to press. You need to make sure that when you give your instruction, you cover all those three elements. Yeah, you tell them what to do, you show them, you demonstrate, and then you let them do it. Whilst they're doing it, yeah, there is your, your first moment to observe the players. And are the players doing what you set out in that organization? Are they going into the right direction? Are they passing in the right direction to the right player? Whatever it is, you're just there to observe. And that observation only needs to be 
a very short period of time because you need to look if the players understand what you mean. Are they doing it in the right way? If, for example, they don't understand, then you have to go back to the instruction. You then have to say, okay, guys, just hold it there for a minute. Let's have a look. That's, and then make sure that you highlight the points where it did go well. That's key. That's an important element for the players to understand to get it right. Yep. Most, most likely, they will get it right. There will be understanding. And then you can already start to give some general coaching comments in terms of in the passing drill that we were doing. I, as you said in the little clip that Paul showed you, it was about coming off an angle. The first pass set it in front of the player, not right to his feet. And then obviously you talk about other things like ball speed, etc., and that sort of stuff. From the general comments, you then go again, when the exercise is going, again, you observe if the players understand. Yeah? If they don't understand, you just go back to your general comments. You just highlight again a few good practices, a few examples of play, and after that, you can again um, reinforce a few general comments to make sure that the players understand what you're after. If they do understand, that's great. You then go to more specific comments. Now, this is where you really put the juice in the exercise. This is where you can really see whether you have to get the players, you know, you challenge the players, you progress the players, so you talk a little bit more, you know, in details, eye to detail. So if it's a passing drill, tell the players to play the right ball speed over the right distances. Yeah, so they need to understand to, when to pass it really firm, really crisp. They need to understand when to take the pace off the ball, to cushion it. They have to understand that they need to play on the right foot, you know, whether it's on the right foot or the left foot. They need to understand all those things. When they receive the ball, can they receive it in a first touch that it straight away takes the ball in the direction you want to go? So these are all specific comments. It's all eye to detail. That really makes uh, the exercise the quality of the exercise again it all depends on the age and the level you're working with yeah yep. if again you look after this specific moment you look at if there's understanding again if there's no understanding yeah you might have to go back to some general comments that means for all the players or you might have to go back to some more specific comments to again to get the players to understand exactly what you want yeah, this is a process that sort of runs through my head whenever I'm doing a training session. Obviously, we're aiming to get the players to understand, which is mostly, most likely, you know, uh, a possibility, and you like to sort of progress through the session. Now, with that progression, that can be a progression within the same exercise. Could be anything, you know, pass the ball on the floor, pass the ball through the air, um, you know, conditions of two touches or or free play, whatever it is you can put in. Progression can be done by many different things. Yeah, conditions you put on it, or areas you change, numbers you change, whatever. If you carry on in through the session, you progress to the next part of the session, you're back to the same thing because you're gonna set up a new organization, you know, like we do going from part A to part B. We go from a passing drill into a sort of a wave attacking scenario where we go box to box, it's a different organization, it needs a different instruction, and we go around again exactly as we did it before. So basically, I wanted to share this with you because this is a really good model. If you practice this and you have this in the back of your head, you, you, you hardly can get any wrong by making your session a success. So hopefully this helps. So this will also be a little bit of a, you know, uh, a, you know, a guidance for us to get through to the rest of the sessions. Okay, Paul. Fantastic. So um, clear, clear guidelines and, and, a, and a clear model developed over, you know, a very long and successful career in coaching. And, and there was a few things you touched on, which are really evident within, within the practice and the sessions that we captured. So, um, you know, I've made a number of notes on, on the session that's available online. Um, and what, one of the first things I pulled um, from the session, from the start in the opening first 10, 20 seconds was the fact that you didn't know these players, but straight away you're trying to build that connection by asking them the names. And, and how important is that 
in terms of building a rapport and connection before you can even get your detail out? Yeah, I, th I think it's very important. Um, I feel that uh, I've had examples where coaches didn't do it and then it becomes really, really impersonal. I think when you do take your time and I sort of learned it, you know, by, by basically trial and error uh, to find ways and means to try to remember the names as quick as I could. And then it becomes personal. So it's better to, you know, to shout a name, whether Johnny or Peter or... Uh, and then they, they were far more receptive straight away. Um, you can see that. So it's just a little, a little thing that I think is very, very important. And yeah. it makes... It, 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 you, you get into a, a, an easier flow quicker with, with those players. Brilliant. And then you, you talk, obviously, in the model, you talk about the, the organisation and the instruction. Something what was, you know, it came through very, very clear was, was the level of detail, but also the instruction there. Um, and, and after you answer this question, I want to show a clip of some of these examples. But from the off, you talk about game realism. You know, you're talking about body shape, sideways on. The, the detail was very, very high. Um, what what was your thinking and approach with that? And I'll show a clip afterwards just to mm. just to demonstrate what we talked about. Yeah, it, it, obviously the, the session that we did, you know, um, with the coaching manual then for the FA, it's obviously been been viewed, I think, by most coaches or a lot of coaches that work at a you know at an advanced level, where eye to detail is very very important. Um, you know, the first and most important thing for every session to make it work, make sure you get the basics right. Um, but a lot of value, a lot of value in a lot of sessions is lost because of lack of eye to detail. You know, I mean, one of, one of the, the biggest qualities that, that top, top players possess is imagination. And you need to try to bring that imagination in the sessions. What, what training is? Training is creating um, an element of, of the game which you take out and create, uh, you know, uh, an organization where the players have the ability to practice it over and over again because practice training is repetition yeah and success that is what you need to try players to experience so you can only get better at something if you do it over and over and over again that's why we've come up over the years with so many different training drills and exercises that all need to have that level of repetition in there and the key is like i said the higher the level the more detail should go in there the more game realistic you want that exercise to be. You can make it really strip it down, really, really basic. You can make it really, really advanced. And like I said, every every particular position in that little passing drill, there are things that you can say, listen, what are the end positions? What do we want there? First touch in front of them. The players around the mannequin, the movement, you know, the dummy come off at an angle. Why not come off straight? Because if you come off at an angle, the mannequin sort of, so you can see the defender, you can see the opponent, you know, and you can see where the ball is coming from. These are little things, you know, as I mentioned, it's eye to detail, which is very, makes a big difference at the top level. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm going to show, show a clip now, Renny, if that's okay with yourself, yeah, on right. some of those things you've just touched on there. So. Come on, let's go. Take, set, plate. Good. Set, bang, plate, and follow. Good. And the next one goes. Good. Come off. Set. Good. Nice. Great. Get a feel for it. That's all it is. Good. Tick. Brilliant. Great. Come on. Keep going. Keep going. Good. Make sure you talk to each other. Come off. Angles. Good angles. Great. Bang. Bang. That's it. Obviously, touching on that clip straight away, the... The session, the first part of this individual, uh, this practice, sorry, is in full flow. Um, and, and you're talking all the time about angles, you know, the, the use of praise all the time. And this, this runs as a, as a constant theme throughout all of, all of your practices as well. So in terms of what you were trying to achieve at, at the start and linking it back to your model, what were you exactly looking for before you could make that next progression, if you like? Uh, yeah, no, the, the, the thing is this, Paul, it's all about, you've got in your back of your head, like I said, the purpose, how you want that session to finish and what the outcomes want to be. To get the players from A to D, so to speak, from A through B through C to D, you need to, you need to sort of, you know, help them to get there and try to put pieces of that soccer jigsaw, you know, into, into play. So this bit, that whole passing drill was nothing else than an introduction 
So again, the players started to think about, listen, I need to think forward, look forward, play forward. How do I support the runs? The quality of the passing for me was important because I wanted to see where the level was at. You know, uh, in terms of if the, if the, ba- the ball is bouncing all the time, if, if the players are not setting it right. But straight away, I could see that the players had a, you know, had a decent level. There was a nice flow throughout the session. Back in terms of the positive coaching, if there's one thing, one thing that stands out in, in the things that I've learned from the great Sir Alex Ferguson that I, you know, was, uh, was fortunate to work with for so many years was, he says the most two important words in coaching are well done. Yeah? Say to the place, every human being likes to be praised and likes to be told the things. That doesn't mean that you can't try to rectify mistakes. But I don't believe in negative coaching. I don't believe in stop, stand still and tell players what's going wrong. There's another way and another time, another place to do it. The key is to coach what is going well. Yeah, And if you see it and throughout the session, you hear me talk a lot. There might be a clip later on where I'm actually just basically stepping back a little bit. Because a lot of coaching as well as is don't say anything, just observe. And basically that is all part of the more you work with those players, the more responsibility you want to give to those players, the more ownership the players will take. And then the lesser you have to step in and you have to then own. What I'm doing now is, is to get um, the reason why I was so actively involved and positively involved is, is because when the players feel that they get constant positive reinforcement, their confidence grows. And I needed for them the confidence grow because they think, hey, we have a, a coaching session here uh, of somebody that coached at Manchester United, that coached at Paul Scholes and Ryan Giggs and Cristiano Ronaldo. A lot of players could be very nervous about that. And I wanted to take that away. And straight away through that passing drill, that worked, that worked really, really well. Right. And, and the next clip I'm going to show is, is actually your progression. So it's clear within the practice, even in part A, that you saw... You saw, you know, you use your observation, you could see the detail, you could see the players got it, and you quickly uh, progressed on to the diagonal pass and allowing players to, to change, change the point of the, of the pass. So I'm just going to share this, this screen as well, just to demonstrate um, how Rennie quickly progressed. You stay in the same site. Well, you come here, so you play it back to Will. Instead of Will, you go in direct, you go in the diagonal. Yeah, so you have to cross over. Same thing with that side here, you cross over there. So you have traffic in the middle, so you need to look at each other. Same thing with the pass, don't hit players running in the middle. Sometimes you need to delay, sometimes you need to speed it up. Yeah, when the gap is there, bang, play it. Okay, that's the whole thing. So we're crossing over now, starting on the same side. Let's go, go. Bang, set, diagonal, and follow. Good, that's it. Fantastic, love it. Bang, bang, diagonal. Good, good communication, keep going, good. Good communication. Take the bounce out. Fantastic, great. That's a good ball, I love it. So so straight away in that clip, a number of things you've talked about in terms of positive coaching, you know, the last comment, love it, and, and, and motivating players. In terms of, you know, coming back to this game realism, which you constantly talk about throughout the session to the players as well, um, what was your thought process with that progression in terms of game realism and, and taking the players to the next level? It, it was all about the players, uh, because in the beginning, the sessions, um, you work also in the sessions like being you know, very structured from very structured and more and more you go towards that the players can make their own decisions. That's where you want to get to, you know, but to get them going, you sometimes tell them, I want you to go from here to here to here to get the exercise going. This was already a progression where the players had an opportunity to play it straight or play it in a diagonal. And then you get, you know, it's all about football, it's all about, you know, diagonal passes, breaking lines, and then the support coming from it. Um, that is what I wanted. I wanted them to experience everything that was needed when I was going into the, the, the next part, which I think is what we need to do now, Paul, is to go into it where it becomes more game realistic. The organisation changes from box to box. Um, you know, there is uh, two goalkeepers in there. There is I put two banks of four of mannequins in there that maybe resembles two banks of four, you know, uh, midfield and, 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 and the back four. There's the sort of gaps and the key is for the players, they go in pairs initially, 
and they use the two link layers to play through into the pockets through those through those two uh, bands of four and then in behind. So you get that really game realistic, break the first line, get the support, break the second line, forward runs, and then obviously you want to get, you know, to get to a finish. This was all about breaking centrally. Yeah, so the players are going very centrally using yeah. the two link players in the pockets. So if you can have a look at it, you know, uh, maybe a clip of that pool, it would be great. So put your hand up, the first two. Yeah, which is? Harry and Merlin. Well done. So the way that we start, Jake, is you get the ball, that's always something, you just roll it in front. Merlin, you carry that ball towards that line. First good touch, you start moving as well, Harry. Yeah? This is sort of the build of face. Then Sun will show in between any of those gaps. So you play into Sun, yeah? You support that pass, Harry. This is basically game realistic sessions now. Box to box, they are game realistic runs. Yeah, a lot of football is played in between the two boxes. Most running has been done between the two boxes. Yeah, so they did the passing drill. Basically, it's much more free now. The only thing that the players need to do is to find those link players in between the two banks of four. Ideally, they want the, the, the pass that goes through the first line needs to hit the furthest link player away. So that the one that comes short can spin, comes underneath, and by that time, the other players have run through, so he can play the ball into space, and then obviously, uh, you know, use, use a finish. Again, purpose, organization, instruction, understanding, all those things come back again. That's what I look for in the first bit. The moment I see that the, the players, the goalkeepers, the, the, the two guys that get on the ball, the link players know what's happening, that's the moment where you start to, again, you know, bring some specific coaching points in, you know, to make sure that you, you lift that exercise as best as you can. One of the things that I haven't touched on in the, in the first part, which is important, and it's also very important in football in general, is, is through the passing drills is to create rhythm. All, all the top teams in, 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 in the game, in, the, in past and present, all the good teams, if they're in possession, they have the ability to create rhythm. And to create rhythm, to maintain rhythm or change rhythm. Those passing drills that we did, it's very important for the players to get them introduced and to get them to experience what rhythm is. Yeah, and you can easily do it by put conditions on it. You know, uh, you have to have two touches or you can only have one touch. Those two things gives a complete different rhythm. So in other words, if you build up from the back and players tend to take two touches because their patience in the build up, it's a different rhythm than when you go into the attacking third, suddenly now it becomes more congested and it all has to switch now to one touch football and movement. You create a different rhythm. Good teams can do it. It's an element that you need to try to develop when the kids get older, you know, um, you know when they start sort of playing into 11 v 11 and understand it. That's what I was looking for here as well. So when they started to go, they start to slow, they maybe play it square, but the moment that first ball breaks that first line, suddenly the rhythm changes. It goes up, back, through. And that is one touch football, and then you come to a finish, which was important, as you, I think when the people look at the session, you know, uh, I wasn't too happy with, you know, the finishing that was going on. And that was, again, another element, another element that you then need to highlight. Listen, guys, yeah. it's all good and well, to get us into good scoring opportunities. But if we don't score, we don't get the reward that we deserve. Yeah, I think, you know, you touched on at the beginning of, of your progression on part B, that the players were struggling to hit the target. But I think one of the things you do throughout your session as well is that positive coaching still. I think if coaches watch your, your session and see the positive coaching, even when players aren't quite getting it at that moment, and the results come as well. And touching on that rhythm um, from obviously that slow build-up play to, to the quick play. And, and I'm going to show a clip, if you don't mind, Renny, of the diagonal runner that, that you spotted here, if, if you don't mind me showing this as well, because I think it, it fits in nicely into exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. So, Fantastic. Um, in terms of in terms of you know that rhythm and players understanding and getting it in the context 
the game because you've got a lot happening in, in, in one activity there. You've got link up players having to work out when to drop and when to, you know, when to stay higher on the line and then the runners off that. How important is it that the players themselves can make that decision within that activity? Well, very important because eventually that's where you want to get to. That's part of the purpose, that the players start to understand what sort of run, what sort of run to make. It's a process you're taking them through. Uh, I, I have to say, you know, this, this session, the whole format that, that the people are, are able to see and the one that have done, we've done this many, many times uh, whilst I was at my time at Manchester United. Yeah, and the players, the players, and you look at the caliber of players that we had, obviously at that time, you know, uh, if you talk about, you know, the Ryan Giggs, the Nani, the Ronaldo's, the Rooney, the, the Scholes and all of them, they, they loved those sort of sessions. And if you look at the amount of running that everybody does, you know, it's a constant really almost, you know, you're going from sort of, you know, 50, 60 percent, eventually you end up to 80 to 90 percent, box to box. It's disguised running, but it's, it's game realistic running. And that's why I, I've, I've sort of brought that diagonal run also into the passing run because I knew this is what we know. Because if you in football only run in straight lines, it's very easy to defend. But as soon as you start to run in diagonal lines, it creates different angles. Opponents have then much more difficulty to sort of gauge, you know, what to do. Do I follow the runner or do I look at the ball? And it's all part of, and that is one of the biggest things, what I, what, you know, what was important for me as a coach at Manchester United, one of the biggest elements that Ferguson was really big on was unpredictability in forward play. Yeah, and that means that the opposition doesn't know what's going to happen, but we do. So unpredictability can only be there when there's options, various options, but also when the players have the ability to make that right decision at the right time, to play the pass in that right area, into feet or into space at the right time, to come and show for the ball, or to run in behind. All those things sort of need to fall into place. The more you practice it, the more it becomes natural, the more the players will take responsibility, the more they will take ownership, the more you step back as a coach, and the more you let them get on with it. And you highlight, constantly highlight, good practices of play. That was great, fantastic. The speed was good, that first pass was excellent, great weight of the ball, great little set, support was perfect, the timing of the run, and what a finish. Now, that is sort of the things that, we, that you want to come back all the time. Because players like to do it because it's great. Most likely, there's always, you know, a shot at goal or a rebound yeah. coming out. So, to progress from here to, you know, the, um, in that, uh, in that uh, third part with the, with the, the, the third part of the thing, was, was all about, and you can show a clip in a minute, uh, Paul was all about that we starting to bring more people in. So this was all about breaking centrally. Yeah. The, the, the eye to detail were for the players that start the exercise was all about, you know, the passing, the first passes into breaking lines, but also for the players in the pockets. Yeah. How do they come up? Not never be in one line, never be in, in horizontally in one line all the way high up. So one, uh, one goes short, one stays away. And the distances need to be important. If you're too far away, you know, the, 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 how do you call it? The link player that comes short but doesn't get the ball is too far away to support the other link player. So yeah. that combination is very important to make sure you keep an eye on it because that creates that, that quick rhythm in the middle of the park, you know, up, back, through. So from here, I then progressed into that uh, breaking with four players. So basically, I put two fullbacks in or two wingbacks, whatever you call them, still the two central players, but now they were breaking in fours. So what I wanted now is, is that we start centrally, yeah, like the fullbacks do, we open up, the goalkeeper gets it, and it creates an opportunity to introduce rotations. And that is such an important key element, you know, in terms of building out from the back. A lot of people talk about building out from the back. We can have a, a completely different webinar about that, Paul, if we wanted to, but the really good coaches have the ability to always find that spare man, that extra man, whether it's in, a, in, in, in the, in the, uh, the build-up third or is it in, you know, in the midfield or in the attacking third. But where does that extra man come from? So yeah. I introduced those rotations by one of the link players dropping in between the two central players. So it makes a three. The other link player stays away. The full-backs go high up. That was one rotation. 
This rotation works very well if you play against two strikers because you're always free one up and the guy that's up, you drag the two strikers across and then the one is free can penetrate into midfield. There's your extra man. Or I had the rotation where the two central guys stay a bit more narrow, the fullbacks go high and then the midfielder drops out in between the fullback and one of the central players. We call that rotating out. The other link player comes central. And then it's all a matter of, again, finding that when you pull people out, you can play around them. And again, it's all about breaking those lines. The key then is to break on the opposite side of the build-up. So if you build up on the right-hand side, can you then break that first line? And can you then switch to play to the other side? Because most likely the whole opposition has moved across you know, to the side where the ball is. So show, show a little clip of that, Paul, just to make it a bit more you know, um, understandable for uh, the viewers. Yeah, and um, like Rennie said, this is part C of, of, of Rennie's delivery where he introduces the two wide players. And before I just show that clip, one thing to point out was um, he was putting players, he was asking players where you play. Do you play wide or do you play centrally? So I'll just ask this question before we show the clip. How important is it to play players in position-specific roles in this sort of activity? For, for, that, for that age group? Very much so. Like I said, this is, this is um, you know, this, I mean, this session you could do in different distances with, with younger players. You know, I could do it with 12-year-olds. But again, yeah. the purpose would be completely different. I wouldn't probably really be too fussed about who is playing centrally, who's playing wide, who's the link players. When you get to 16 and beyond, then it is very important. So the players feel very comfortable to sort of the areas of the pitch. So you put your right back in that position or the right winger, or a wing back and the left on the same side. So you get the players and it will also enhance the quality of the sessions because you've got players playing in the natural positions. Fantastic. So I'm going to show two clips back to back. Rene, I'm going to show the structure and I'm going to show one of your examples about um, utilising the width and a, defend, and, a, and a midfielder actually rotating out as well. Um, Great. So, When the exercise starts, the two central ones, you come outside like this. The moment that happens, the fullbacks, you move on. Move beyond them, move beyond them. You're slightly advanced. Stop there, great. That's just the start of it, okay? Then you, Kit, you come in between. Well done, defenders, good. Well done, Connor, good. That's it, great. Well done. Oh, can we get there? Need to be quick. Oh, look, a good cross that. Great cross. This, again, this, this activity progressed very quickly with you introducing a defender um, in, into, into the practice to really challenge players in that final third. Um, what, what was, the, you know, what was the, the cue for that and what did you want to achieve with your players by then introducing those defenders into it? Well, again, to make it, just to make it more game realistic uh, as, as we progressed, um, if you would ask me, you know, listen, if I would have worked with this group, you know, week in, week out, maybe two or three times a week, I would probably spend a lot of time in, at this session here because there's so much, so many more elements uh, of tactical coaching in terms of building up uh, and creating that rhythm and passing. I would spend a lot of time for players to understand very clearly what I mean by rotating in. So you saw a few times that the player with the green bib dropping. You know, yeah. but he didn't really completely drop in. Yeah, what I would have wanted ideally was that he drops even deeper. So you get sort of three players and the two central players or the, the centre backs are sort of slightly advanced, you know, of him and a bit more, you know, a bit more playing in between them first. The, 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 the key then is, is that, you know, again, is that the timing of, okay, when, when do we now play that ball forward? Because most likely those three have to outplay, you know, uh, an opponent or maybe two. It is something that I've introduced in the last part of, of this session, where they do have to do that. Um, and then again, it's all about as well as, you know, the guys that are constantly coming in the pockets, you know, that they're making sure that, because obviously the mannequins are static, that's the only sort of not so realistic thing. But if you want to make, you know, for the players to have repetition and success, this is the best way to do it, because the emphasis is on getting the players through the lines in the forward runs and using the width. 
That was the main purpose here. Now, because you're breaking with four players now, through the lines, and eventually yeah. I've also had, you know, one of the link players giving him the opportunity to break through, I started to introduce defenders. So the defender sort of took a static position behind the two central mannequins, yeah, on each side, because the wave yeah. went from this side and then to that side. So two players were standing behind the mannequins, and initially one of the defenders was dropping in. So basically you still had one, one guy was crossing, so basically you had 3v1 in attack. So again, looking for, you know, players to, you know, to finish, put a good crossing. The, 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 one of the other main things now was, okay, now we're getting into the final third. Where are we looking for now? Because this is the most important part. This is where the right decision making comes in, in, in terms of crosses. How early do I cross it? Where do I cross it? What type of cross? Yeah, if there's a lot of space in between the defenders and the goalkeeper and the defenders are, are facing their own goal, so there's a lot of space, you're looking for those early crosses in front, in the face of the goal, where, you know, the players can run onto. They're very hard to defend, very hard to defend, and goalkeepers don't know whether to stay or to come. Yeah. Then if you move up further up the pitch, around the sort of 18-yard line, again, you look at different sort of crosses. It could be a near-post cross, for the striker or the opposite winger to run across the box, which is very hard to defend as well. Or maybe a flat ball across the 18 yard where an opposite winger can come in and then have a shot from, you know, in and around the box area. If you get to the byline and depending how close you are to the goal, it's all about really setting it up, you know, to the back post space, yeah. Yeah, uh, sort of thing, or maybe a pullback for somebody to run on. So basically loads of things happening in the back, in the, in the, in the attacking third now. To make it a little bit more challenging for those attacking players, I put a defender in. If I see through the session that those players have chance after chance, goal after goal, I then progress with two defenders. So now they really are starting to play 4v2. Can we outplay? Let's say the two fullbacks have been up the pitch. They've been countered against. They broke the lines quickly. How can the two defenders with a goalkeeper defend a six-yard box and a penalty area? How can the three, four players that broke outplay them, you know, and, and get a chance and a shot of as quick as possible? Brilliant. And and there's a nice, you know, there's a nice moment within the practice of you being very, very clear in detail with the players on those crossing, um, you know, those, those crossing cues and, and based on what space you have available and what, you know, what options you have available, what should your decision be. So uh, I would guide all coaches to, to watch Rennie actually deliver that out on the field. Uh, and it links, it links nicely into to the final part, which was, was then really a, a conditioned game and getting it close to the game as you can. And you started then to about the importance of, you know, making sure you capitalise when you've got possession, making sure you've, you've got that change of rhythm in the final third to get your shots away, and also defend, making sure you're in a position to either, to defend against the counter-attack, or if you're the team defending, you can counter-attack. So um, I'm going to show the structure of part D, which was your seven versus five um, wave, um, and then I'd like you to talk about when you introduced the second ball and why, because I thought that was a was a really interesting coaching point about the attacking team actually getting a second ball and you clarified it. So I'm just going to share um, the setup, which is your final practice into the 7v5. You can sort of make it difficult for him, but he'll play, it doesn't matter. Go past him, boom. First ball into Connor. The moment that ball gets into Connor, Blues, you can come alive. Yeah? Then you, Connor, join in. You stay there, Dan. You guys come in and you play seven against five. Yeah? Unlimited touches. Keep moving that ball. Bang, 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 bang. If the ball goes out... Benny, if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the, the, the two ball. Just pick it up. Come and collect it. Bang! They're alive. Good. Forward. Good. Let's go. Good. Let's go. Don't give it away. Good. Keep playing. Good. Good. Find the spare man. Find that spare man. Connor, you can score as well. I can score as well. 
Excellent. Great, great, great. Good. Fantastic. Now relax. Second ball. Second ball. Play. Let's go. Don't give it away. Keep that ball. Keep that ball. Keep that ball. Good. Keep it in. Keep that ball. Good. Use that spare man. Song. That's it, Song. Fantastic. Magnificent. Can we deliver? All play. Good. One, twos. Clever balls. Great. Good football. And again. And again. Moving it. Good. Play on. Keep playing. Keep playing. Yes, Connor. Good. Yes, son. Good. Sunil. Sunil. Blue. Blue. Play. 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 Come on. Go. Go. Dan. Go. Go. Ah, relax. Ah, relax. Brilliant. Reds. Walk out. There's even in that short one minute 30 second clip, Benny, there's so much in there. So I'll start with obviously the two ball question of of why would you put in a second ball for for the team in possession, even though they've just lost possession? What was your thought process behind that? Well, let me first let me first say uh, Paul, when I watch this back, I, whilst watching the back, I, I actually get excited again. You know, uh, <laughs> you have to bear in mind it was it was a group that I've never worked with, and you never know whether whether you can get it because basically this part and and obviously. There wasn't the part, you know, E and F, and we'll talk about it later, but, yeah. you know, we want them to get, you know, to a level of, of play where you can actually see the players having success in, in what they've trained. There's no, there's no better satisfaction for any coach yeah. uh, to see that, you know, to just to, um, and it's basically something, you know, that, that comes up, you think about. If you would have not introduced that second ball and you just go for one ball, this exercise will not flow. Because you get constantly breakdown, you know what I mean. You, don't, you will, you, what you will see is that players don't really get a rhythm. Uh, some players might not even touch the ball. Uh, the game breaks down and it goes the other way. So to make sure that the players, on the attacking side, have a level of success whilst they getting into a more and more game realistic playing scenario, two things: the overload. They're still playing seventy five, so they got two extra players. So they shouldn't give the ball away because again. If you would team them up and you would go 77 or 66, whatever it is, again, I just want to make sure that literally you, and the purpose that you want is that the players are understanding, you know, in lines, forward passes, this. This now is all about, yes, we come into the final third. Yeah, it's not about breaking lines now. It's, it's outplaying a tight defense. So it's slightly different. So they need to sort of think about, okay, back to the first passing drill. It's all important again. Sometimes you have to play, play square, play around to play through, to find, have that patience to do it. That second ball is then there again. So when that first ball breaks down, they almost get a second chance, you know, because if the first ball, if it's a goal, great. If it isn't a goal, they get a second chance. But there's also an element of transition in there. So yeah. players need to be fixed on. Yeah, so they got two balls, two goals, and that probably goes around, I would think, you know, if you look at it, it was a clip of one and a half, one and a half minute, I think, which yeah. is great because the intensity is there. You know, uh, what you want, a game realistic in, in intensity. So you look always look for quality and intensity. These things are interlinked. The third ball, however, I used is to also give some sort of reward to the defending team. Because at any given moment, when that defending team would intercept the ball and they are capable of passing it, the first thing they needed to look for was pass into that striker, you know, that was waiting up front in the attacking half to go bang, to break the line. That's your counter-attack. Yep. Boom, straight away. So that third ball, if it doesn't happen through an interception, yeah, then the third ball is played into the defending team. The defending team can then have a counter-attacking, a breaking thing. And you're back to breaking lines quickly and try to, you know, break in numbers and, and score goals. It's a great, it's a great exercise. It's a great drill. You can do it in, in, many, in many different uh, organizations and numbers. Box to box is really game realistic. I chose for five v five plus the three link players that you uh, that were in a black outfit, and one of the link players was sort of the opponent striker. Yeah. So the build up team had to play one of those one of those players who could only stay in the half, and then the other two players then 
you know, in the black outfit would help the team, you know, outplay that pack defense that would come alive as soon as you would break that first line. Um, ideally, with, with, with first team players, uh, like I said, I've done it many times with United, I've done it many times now with the Australian national team as well, because it's constantly about the same thing. Think forward, look forward, play forward. That needs to get in the head. Players, if you don't tell them, if you don't influence the subconscious, many players just go the safe way. So they go square or back. Yeah? yeah? No. When you can go forward, go forward. That's the most dangerous pass. The key is, is to, for players to understand and not to force it, not to start playing forward when it's not on. Now, and that is what in those things are happening because when you are in the attacking third and the game becomes condensed more numbers in a tight area, you need to change that rhythm. It, it goes into that, you know, that bouncing one touch play, bring it over to one side, boom, get it out the other way and then can be penetrated. It becomes more and more game realistic and like I said, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, session that I've done many, many times. And over time, the more you do it, the players get better and better at it. And you can see, you know, you see, you see uh, some fantastic build-up and, and attacking play. It was, it was really interesting to see how the session actually progressed and how quickly the players understood the concepts that you were talking about as well. Even in that minute and 35 second clip, um, you see Son, the midfielder, look to switch the play quickly, recognising the compactness and his teammates staying out wide, which was actually built through the progressions of the practice. You could see it happening staged um, all the way from part A through to part D um, and players then recognising it in a game situation. Um, and I know on the day, obviously, we, we was down with time constraints, but but what would what would be the end goal in terms of that practice? What would be the setup? Because I know we didn't get there, um, yeah. and you touched on that. Yeah, probably again, depending on the numbers that, that you would have got, I probably would have gone for probably let's say you know seven v seven, you know, with goalkeepers eight v eight, whatever you call it, plus maybe one still maybe one or two uh, link players, neutral players, so you still create an overload. Yep. So you still have an opportunity for those those link players to uh, to help the team in possession, and the, obviously the defending team has to work a little bit a little bit harder. But again, you're still looking for the same things. The other thing I would probably introduce again as a progression after that would say that the defending team, for instance, the attacking team has to almost sort of defend all the way up to the halfway line. So when the defending team, you know, the ball changes hands, the link players become their players. So now they have an overload. But when that attacking team is defending right high against that halfway line, you're back again by breaking lines quickly and getting in behind. So it's all about that, that, that early quality ball in behind, you know, forward runs, bang. Basically, um, you know, a, a lot of what, what, what Liverpool has been excellent at this year, you know, on the Jurgen Club with, with their Salah, Firmino and, and Mane. You know, very dynamic, very direct, very this. I think in the time... When I was at United in that period between 2007 and 2013, we had a little bit of both. If you, if you compare those teams, you know, the top teams with, with Liverpool now running away with, with the league and being very dynamic, very direct, very quick. Whereas if you look at Manchester City's and Pep Guardiola's team, it's a little bit more uh, almost a knee, um, keyhole surgery. You know, it's short passes, you know, they're working around the pitch. You hardly, you hardly ever see a long ball going direct or switch, they work their way on the pitch, they work the numbers up on the pitch. And in our time, we had a bit of both. We had a bit of both. We could do this, we could keep the ball, because we had excellent players in keeping the ball, but we also could go very, very direct. Again, it all, it's all about being unpredictable in forward play. And how, how you execute it, it all depends on the players that you've got, but also the opposition, uh, who you're playing against, and whether you're playing at home or away. Great stuff. So, obviously looking to bring um, the, the session to a close and you, you open with your guidelines for practice, obviously with your, with your Muenstein method and, and looking at the setup. How does that then support you when you're looking back at the practice and potentially into the next practice? Does that, does that process still apply, do you think? Yeah, definitely. You can, you can bring that model back up and you, you go back and start and you look at the purpose 
of the session and you then have to realistically look, okay, what have I actually achieved? What I wanted to achieve on, on a scale of 10, you know? Did I achieve everything? 10 out of 10, you know, which if you are fantastic, you're a fantastic coach, you know, most likely you start to look somewhere, you know, I would say between six, seven and eight. If you have an eight, you have a fantastic session. Fantastic, brilliant. You, you, you get the players, players, coaching as well is all about awareness and understanding. Bringing players from awareness to understanding. Are they aware what they try to achieve? In this case, are they aware that they need to sort of in the heads, think forward, look forward, play forward? Have they got the, you know, the, the attributes, you know, uh, to actually execute it? And then it's all about that understanding. You know, are they, do they understand, obviously, when to play forward, the timing of the runs, all those things that come in, it becomes obviously quite a little bit technical. But that is what coaching is about. Repetition, success, bringing players from awareness to understanding. You then look through that model and say, okay, the organization that I chose, was that the right one? Did I have the distances right? Did the players challenged enough? Because that is always an important key in, in training sessions. If I say, um, if you would say to me, Paul, listen, Renny, what are the sort of key, you know, the key PIs of a good training session? I would say one, purpose. Always a good purpose. Number two, challenge. Make sure you challenge the players. And that challenge could be anything. It can be a technical challenge. It could be a tactical challenge. It can be a physical challenge or a mental one. If you look at this sessions, a lot of those things are in there. Yeah, there is, there is a tactical challenge of it because they need to make the right decisions and the right runs. There's a physical challenge because they need to make those runs between box to box. You know, there is a technical challenge because it's all game realistic, passing, crossing, shooting, everything goes with it. Yeah, and there's a mental challenge, especially in that last, in that last game. There's a lot of transitioning. I keep defending. I don't give anything away. On the ball, we need to keep the patience. We need to make sure that we do well. So, the one, purpose, challenge. Then I look for two things, quality and intensity. These are two things that are interlinked. Yeah, if one of the things are not there, if the intensity is too high, players make mistakes. If the intensity is too low, it's not game realistic. If you look through all the sessions that we did, part A, B, C, and D, that quality intensity was constantly there. Yep. Yeah, you can always you ask yourself, the quality can always be higher, but it was sort of it was sort of there. I was happy with it, let me put it that way. If you've got those four, the last thing, most importantly, players will enjoy it. Players will enjoy the sessions. Fun is the most important element of them all, them four. So again, back to the model, you walk just one model, walk in the organization, think about how your instruction was, was that clear? Size, did the players understand quickly? If not, you need to think about, you know, how you're going to do that next time. What were your general key coaching points that you give to all the players that are important? Then again, you go back to their understanding, um, then more eye to detail, more specific coaching, you know, to certain players individually, you know, um, especially when you work very tactically because you can start to affect different positions of the pitch. Yep. And eventually you start to look in the progression and you're back round again. So, as when that, 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 that's why I show the model. The model is there for you to get prepared really well. And it, it is a guideline in your head what you do in the session. But at the same time, it's a great tool to reflect back on your sessions because you can go through back again and you can just plus and minuses what you think went well or what you think you need to improve upon next time. Thanks for that, Rene. So um, just to conclude, um, we are just over the hour mark. So I'd like to say a massive thank you, obviously, to the coaching manual for hosting, uh, to yourself, Rene. I will let, pass it over shortly for some closing words from yourself. Um, for those interested in viewing Rene's session that we, we captured with the LMA, um, go to thecoachingmanual.com. Uh, we are going to release this webinar recording and there's been hundreds of questions being sent in, Rennie. So um, we can't get through them all by, by um, our audience, but Rennie's, Rennie's agreed to go through some of those questions and we will produce some materials um, so that your questions are answered. And I'm hoping we can get you back on, Rennie, and really tap in you know, to, your, to your vast knowledge, your vast experiences, um, because it's, it's very, very relevant for, for coaches of all levels. So. Um, I'm going to pass it over to yourself if you've got any closing remarks um, and anything you'd, li you'd like to pull up. Um, I know in North America where I'm based, you do, you do quite a lot with, with your, uh, your Mullenstein method as well. So anything you're, 
any final thoughts from yourself really that I'm handing over? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think um, when, when, when the, the coaching manual, uh, i.e. Chris uh, Barton, uh, contacted me about if I would be interested in, in doing something like this, um, I straight away said yes. Like I said in the, in the opening words, it's a difficult time for all of us. It's a difficult time for everybody involved in football. Everybody, a lot of people are just tied to their houses and their homes. And uh, I think this is a great way still for the football world to connect together. Uh, we, we can reach a massive audience, a lot of people at the same time. Uh, like I said, I hope that those webinars are very informative, they're educational. Uh, I, I hope that there is also uh, you know, an, an entertainment level in there. Um, as well, at times it's difficult because the only one that I see is Paul. Yeah. Uh, You've got the short straw, Rene. <laughs> yeah, I've got the short straw, but no, that's, it's important. What I do like to say is one for the ones that are, went on, please do. Do give your feedback to the coaching manual. Uh, we are planning in, in cooperation with the Moonlisting Method and, and GIS Global Image Sport and Coaching Manual to come up with many more webinars because the football is, is so diverse and there's so many topics we can, we can talk about in an hour. And like I said, I've got over 40 years of experience, worked at every level, and I'm more than happy through those webinars to share my expertise and experience. So for me, uh, on this half, I enjoyed it tremendously. I think time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Minutes, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I hope to see you. Uh, I hope to see you soon on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rene. And, and like Rene said, we're looking to do more, more and more. And I've had the privilege to to know Rene for ten plus years. And and we, we can carry on for days, Rene, <laughs> with this stuff. So it's 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 going to be a great journey. And we really thank. Thank you for your support and for your insights. So have a great evening, everyone on the, on the webinar. Um, thanks for joining us. We do appreciate your support. Um, and we'll, we'll look um, to deliver more content of this type. So thank you, Rene. No problem. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.